This is Nicole Sox from the Holler Homestead giving you a woman's take on the walk towards independence because we're living free in Tennessee. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Monday, February 27, 2017, and this is episode 25 of Living Free in Tennessee. And it's a great time to learn how to do canning if you've never tried. On today's show, I will walk you through a specific recipe that you can try at home with produce purchased at the store for your first canning project. Also, if you've wondered how my pickles taste so awesome, this is that recipe. Uh, People make canning seem really hard and scary, and earlier this year I mentioned that we will produce a video series on home canning that takes you through several home preservation projects, starting with the easiest and getting a little more advanced each time, so that instead of like reading tons and tons of different descriptions of how to can and worrying your way through it, you can just do things one at a time, do some hands-on learning, and be really good at canning by the end of this series. And I think I'm going to call it Learn Canning with Eight Home Preservation Projects. Pretty simple title, a little boring. If somebody has a better idea, let me know. Also queued up for the show is another marvelous segment from Samantha the Savings Ninja. She'll give us her top picks for phone apps that can save you money. And before we head into our regular segments today, I have some news to share with you. Holler Roast Coffee is officially for sale online at livingfreeintennessee.com. That's right. If you have been curious to taste our home roasted beans, now you can. It's 14 bucks a pound plus shipping, and the best shipping rate is for the biggest amount you can order, which is five pounds, but there's a pretty good price break at two pounds, and it's, I mean, the shipping is based on flat rate boxes, basically, that the United States Postal Service offers. Um... As always, we've been selling this locally for many years. So if you live nearby and want to either do a farm pickup, meet me in Smithville or Cookville or pick it up at the store where I sell it in Smithville, there are no shipping charges. Uh, Just head over to livingfreeintennessee.com and click on the coffee link. And I did set something up special just for you. Uh, through the end of March. If you use the coupon code LIVETN, L-I-V-E-T-N, you'll get 10% off your order. It doesn't matter how many times you use it all month long. Just for being a listener, you get 10% off. And I'm only saying that here. I'm not going to put it out digitally because this is really for you guys who've been supporting me while I learned how to share our stories through this new medium. And I really appreciate your support. So that's that's one way. If you're interested in coffee, I can give you a little discount um, just as a thank you. And you know what? I read on the internet a pretty cool quote this week, and it kind of relates to finally getting this, sh- this coffee thing online, like, deployed. Uh, here's the quote. The secret of change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And that came from my friend Lisa over on Facebook. Uh, the she she labeled it as an unknown author. Uh, if somebody knows who said that, that'd be great. I didn't find anybody to whom you could attribute that quote, but I saw that right after my podcast last week, and I just printed it out and put it on my wall because I had been really worried about some things that needed to be done or that were leftovers from other efforts and uh, put it up there. And every time I got off topic, I went back to that quote, reminded myself to, to just get rolling. And I was able to get many things done that were, you know, things like that. That coffee shopping cart wasn't super easy to do. People have been asking me for a long time to put it up. Um, and I kept saying, oh, just email me. And we'd always set up, you know, little transactions through PayPal on the side. And I'm kind of excited that I can just say, go to this one place and do it. And there's not a lot of back and forth manual interaction anymore. So that's pretty cool from a, just an efficiency standpoint. That means I can concentrate on the podcast. I can po- concentrate on roasting good coffee and not worry so much about the coordination. And so let's do our usual segments. Uh, First up, we have eating seasonally. Last week was a great week. Uh, This is where we share what we're eating as it comes to us. Um, Well, dead nettle. I think I talked to you about dead nettle last week in a little bit more detail. It is really coming into its own. I'll probably have it for another three weeks unless we get 90 degree days. 
and the bees haven't really found it yet because we have quinces in our yard and the quinces are beautiful and red and blooming and covered in bees. So dead nettle is something we're eating this week. And then chickweed or Stellaria media is a, it's a plant that oddly enough, maybe you couldn't tell this by, by the name, you can feed it to your baby chicks or your chickens or your other poultry. You can actually probably feed it to your goats. I didn't look into that. Um, I'm sure you can feed it to goats. Anyway, it's a very nutritious plant that tastes pretty good for humans too. It's It's got a very mild flavor, a little nutty is how I describe it. It's not, it's not arugula-ish. It's not lettuce-ish. It's kind of in between those two things. And it's pretty fun to identify. What you do when you see it, you'll, if you look up online, I, I put a link uh, to Wikipedia so you can see all about the plant on the show notes. But when you find what you think is chickweed, and it looks kind of like baby's breath, it's this kind of viney thing with white blossoms that come out and you you pull it and the stem will break but there'll still be an inner stem that's connecting the two pieces now if you pull super hard that won't happen but if you just gently pull that happens that's one of the ways that you can tell this plant from other plants that look sort of like it and in our garden we have tons of chickweed and i just grab it by the handful and I toss it at the ducks, I toss, toss it at the chickens, and they go bonkers over it. They love it. Uh, well, here's the cool thing about chickweed, is you can slice this up on a salad, and it's really good. You can dice it up in a saute, and it's really good. You can make vegetable stock out of it, really good. This plant is very versatile. It's tasty. Now, the stems can get a little stemmy, uh, but not too bad. What I do, I do what with this, what I do with watercress, which is... I like to cut it up pretty finely and and then from there I use it however I'm going to use it. I think the one caution on chickweed is it grows around and in other plants. So when you're harvesting it, be sure that you just harvest the chickweed. Now, chickweed is something that a lot of people find annoying in their garden because it's a weed and it's in the way. And obviously, if you're germinating lettuce seeds somewhere and there's chickweed in your way, you need to pull it off of there because it will choke them out. But I find that it makes a pretty good like green ground cover for those parts of the beds where I'm not using them yet. And it comes out so easily. It doesn't have really deep roots. So it comes out really easily for us and I let it grow in my garden to keep other more difficult to remove weeds out of there. Now, if you're thinking of living off the land and worried about getting all the right balance of vitamins and minerals from the ground, chickweed's actually a pretty good dietary supplement. And think about this. In most cases, it's coming out in early spring when many of us, if we were not supplementing our food with vegetables and other fresh things from other regions, might be a little low on some, you know, some of the things that come from plant matter. Well, chickweed is high in vitamin C. It has beta carotenes in there, calcium, magnesium, potassium, manganese. It's got a lot of just vitamin-y things (laughs) that are good for your body. It's also got some interesting herbal uses in settling a digestive system issues, um, cleaning out lymph node problems that you might have. If you look it up, on, in fact, I'll give give a link to some of its herbal uses just from in herbal medicine. It's used to, to treat like cuts and, and things like that. It's, it's a pretty good plant to have in your yard. So if you don't have it growing wild like we do, consider getting some seeds for chickweeds and uh, getting them going in your yard. They are very seasonal. Like it will come right now and it will not be back in the fall. It's not one of those ones that in Tennessee, sometimes we get like the spring growing of stinging nettle, and then we get the fall growing. You don't get that with chickweed. It comes out this time of year. It does not store or dry well either. So you want to use it while it's there and then learn to use something else for those things. Now, I've also read that you can make a tea out of chickweed, which I haven't tried, but I'll try it this week. And what you do is you take two to three tablespoons of, I'm sorry, teaspoons of fresh chickweed that has been diced up, put it in your mug, 
pour fresh boiled water over it and let it steep for 10 minutes and then pour that through a strainer otherwise you'll get grits in your teeth or rather plant matter in your teeth and that can be very embarrassing later in the day uh, so that's chickweed tea and I, I would think if you're looking to use chickweed to soothe digestive issues that's a really good way to use it so anyway, that's one of the things that's coming on this week. I wanted to go a little more in detail on what it was, how to use it. Like really guys, if you can get over the fact that you're eating wild plants, dice up some chickweed. It doesn't even have weird texture issues and it's so good with salad. So it just adds another dimension to your salads. Another thing coming on are dandelion greens and i actually put together a fresh salad mix for our new hauler member ford so he could try out some of the things because these are these are plants that he has not eaten before and the next day i talked to him i said so how'd you like that wild salad and he said that salad was good it took me a minute to get over the fuzzy texture but after i did it was really good and I, I kind of laughed. He said, I think that was the dead nettle. And I said, yeah, that was the dead nettle. So, you know, word to the wise, when you're trying wild plants, sometimes you may have an unfamiliar texture and dead nettle does have a little, it's not like a peach fuzz fuzz, but it's like that only less. And so when I use it in salads, I do get my ratios in there. I don't like do all dead nettle for the salad. I put it in, you know, like maybe quarter cup of that, a cup of chickweed, um, quarter cup of dandelion leaves and then two or three cups of watercress, which is what he got. So anyway, that was, that was feedback from somebody who's not used to eating the stuff all the time. And the other thing that's going on this week is it is time for us to harvest our annual stinging nettles for tea. And this is, this requires a hike up into the woods to my favorite stinging nettle patch. I had one down in the yard last year and it got mowed by Mark. And then we had the droughty stuff in in August. So it didn't come back for fall from the roots and it did not reseed itself. So we do not have my favorite nettle patch. So we're going to take a hike up there. Probably I'm going out of town this week. So when I get back, we'll hike up there and harvest garbage bags full of this stuff and start drying it in my food dehydrator. And I hang it up as well. And then <clears throat> we will also make, you know, some fun stinging nettle dishes, like stinging nettle soup is so good. In fact, I'll tell you how to make that in a second. And then I'm going to dig up a few plants and move them down to a couple places in my yard where I think they'll be really happy. And and my goal there is to get them started again where they got mowed and have it clearly marked so they don't get mowed ever, ever again. And then also be able to collect some of the seeds because stinging nettles really become a part of our regular medicinal teas and some other hat you know just eating it's it's a very tasty soup and speaking of soup here's how you make stinging nettle soup now the thing you need to know about stinging nettles is when you boil them the stinging part goes away so when you're collecting them of course they can they can get you so i wear leather gloves but once you've collected them and either dried them or boiled them no more sting if you just eat them like straight on your salads raw, you don't want to do that. Now, I have read that you can put them in the fridge for a certain amount of time and then use them on salads and that works. I haven't personally tested it. I will test that this year because it actually doesn't bother me too badly to get stung by nettles. I just won't taste anything for the rest of the night if it does not work. I'll tell you how that goes because it's not going to kill me. It's just going to make my tongue hurt. So I'll, I'll, be, the, uh, I'll be the guinea pig and, and refrigerate some leaves, then put them on a salad and tell you how that works. So anyway, here's how you make stinging nettle soup. You, you harvest stinging nettles and you want to produce about four to eight cups, depending on how big your batch is. We'll go with four cups of stinging nettle leaves. So you pull them off the stem. I do that with my gloves on so I don't get stung. And then you bring those into the house and you take um, one cup or two, no, two cups of soup stock, and the stinging nettle leaves, and you just boil them. Now, if you're a vegetarian, just use water instead. That's fine. Um, I'd throw, at that point, I'd throw some onion in there to make sort of an oniony stock or use vegetable stock. Anyway, simmer that for like 20, 25 minutes. And then you add garlic and two cups of heavy cream, and you use your stick blender to puree, like puree it all up so that it becomes more like a bisque consistency. 
and serve it with a little dollop of sour cream. Really good. If you want to make it a little thicker, then just take one potato and, and peel it and cube it up in there with the stinging nettle. And and it'll it'll boil the mushiness. And then when you puree it up, that adds a little body, a little more body to the soup stock. Another thing you can do with that is add a hot pepper to add a little zing. But I think that takes away from the flavor of stinging nettle soup. Now your, your soup ends up being this really vibrant green color. It's kind of a cool thing to, to serve on yeah, St. Patty's Day. And hey, it'll be in season. How cool is that? Naturally green soup for St. Patrick's Day, guys. We're going to totally have to do that. Um, do salt it to taste and pepper it to taste. It's really good. If you don't like garlic, don't add garlic. If you do like garlic, throw it in at the beginning of the whole thing. Or or when you add the cream, if you want a stronger garlic flavor. I like a, a nice gentle garlic flavor in that. So that's stinging nettle soup. We probably won't make that till next week because I'm going out of town, as I said. We are also hoping to see some more wild mustard coming up this year. Hasn't popped up yet. And I'm keeping my eye out for pokeweed. Now, last but not least, the other thing, we're still eating watercress. And when watercress is available, it's like a liver cleanser. So it's really good for getting stuff out of your system in addition to being a tasty thing to eat. So we're eating watercress like mad. This has been the best year for watercress so far. In fact, it's doing so well that I have been selling plants for local pickup for other people to get their watercress patches started. And so a couple people have, we've sold, I guess, 20 plants so far for pickup, and I'll be delivering those next Saturday. There are about 20 plants left, so if you're in our area, you can totally, you know, go to livingfreeintennessee.com, and you can order those plants or just shoot me an email. Um, I do really want to help get the plants out there. If people are interested in establishing watercress patches of their own, they like to grow in either not moving water or slowly moving water. If you do that, you don't have to tend them. You can put them in the soil and keep them well watered and they'll grow in soil. But where I always put them is in a slow moving creek. And so if you don't have that already, I wouldn't mess with watercress this year. It's it's something that's kind of you you need to know what you're doing to get it established. And then once it's established, it's a really good plant to have on your homestead. Okay, next up, we have getting the gardens ready. This is where we share what we're doing to get our food growing operation up and running for the year. And I'm pleased to announce that our tomato seeds are in the trays and they germinated in only three days. Why so fast, you ask? Well, I have been using seed heat mats for about six years and I originally started using them because I started my seedlings up in the greenhouse and at this time of year it's kind of cold up there. Even if the sun hits it, it's cold because usually it's not 70 degrees outside at this time of year. So I got these seed mats to just help with germination up there and then I realized the best thing to do is put the seeds in the trays with a seed mat under it and keep it at a fairly stable 60 to 70 degrees. So then that brings it up about 20 degrees. So it's 80 to 90 degrees for tomatoes. This means they'll germinate in three days. You need to water those every single day. Sometimes I check twice a day on those. So I had some up in two days this time and then the rest up in three days. Super excited about that. And I'm really glad I have those mats already. They're not cheap, but they're not too bad. Like I got mine for 20 or 30 bucks originally. And you don't, I mean, like if you have one or two mats, you can get things germinated and then transfer them somewhere. Or if you can afford a few more, you can keep those those seeds nice and toasty warm as you're getting them started. We also have been heavily involved in the national or holler poop proceeding 2017. It is now time to move manure from the other coops up to the garden and the tractor has been a great help. However, I'm not very good at starting the tractor, but I'll tell you more about that later. So we've been just getting it up there and getting all of our beds ready. Some of the beds were already ready from the fall. Those are the ones I am planting in. And then by May, when a lot of my stuff goes out into the yard, 
those will be ready to go. Peas, lettuce, and other early seeds are in both in the ground and will be going into trays in the greenhouse. This is because some things that they say direct sow don't always direct sow well here. And the one I'm thinking of, the two I'm thinking of in particular are kale and Swiss chard. Great plants to grow. Really tasty. They give you greens well into the summer. But they don't always germinate well, even though they say you can direct sow outside. So I've, I'm going to be putting some out under row cover this week, and then I'll get trays started up inside the greenhouse. And that brings up a sore topic for me, the greenhouse. Why did I buy this greenhouse? It seemed like a really, really good deal about six years ago or seven years ago when we bought it. And it's one of those kits that you put together that I think they sell them at Tractor Supply now about a thousand bucks so not cheap and they come with these polyurethane panels that look like cardboard like corrugated cardboard and they're supposed to last 10 years mine lasted three and they're forever blowing off the darn thing and I'm redoing the roof but I haven't finished and I have to finish so one of our priorities has just bumped up and that greenhouse roof is getting done so that I can put my plants in there and That's just the way it is. But if you're thinking of getting a greenhouse kit, don't get it. Don't get that kit. It's a terrible kit. Like either look at a hoop that you put plastic over that you know you're going to have to replace the plastic every year or go look for a real greenhouse because, you know, maybe build one from scratch or go learn how to make them out of scrap windows that you find. There's like lots of ways to make greenhouses. And although this has gotten me through six years for a thousand dollars, And I'm going to make it work because it's there and the foundation is there and it's doing fine. It's still, it is taking a lot more maintenance than I wanted to have to do to the greenhouse. Remember when I told you that super kale had died? Guess what? More kale is coming up where it was. So I think it's roots set up, sent up little plants. So we're going to have another kale, kale off or a head to head battle between the kale and the comfrey. That's right. Epic rap battles in my garden. Last year, what happened is the kale just put out a two foot long stem and then started coming up while the comfrey got bigger and bigger. And then the comfrey died back and the kale gave me some leaves over the winter. And now it's got little baby kales right where the comfrey is again. I'll probably try to transplant some too. It depends on how the roots are. But that should be a little fun thing going on. And I'm really pleased about that because I did not start my kale seeds four weeks ago when I was supposed to. So... I don't have kale to transplant into my garden now. Although that doesn't mean it's too late for kale. You can totally still do kale here in Tennessee. You just want to use row cover. The sweet potato slip update for the week. I've got four potatoes going strong now. I've got like seven slips starting right now. That means in about two to four weeks, I will have my first slips ready to go and the ground won't be ready for them. So you know what I'm going to do? Pick them off, root them, put them in dirt like in a pot, in a warm place until it's a good time to put them outside. I do not want those outside while it is still at risk to get down into the 30s. Bad idea. Even the 40s, not so great. Sweet potatoes like it warm, man. And I want to give them a leg up because they are a great like row cover. They make really good sweet potato food. They make great greens in the summer. And it looks like I will have some to share. In fact, I already talked to somebody who's visiting today from the eastern part of the state and told her, I'm going to have enough slips. You're going to get some. And she she did a little cheery dance. So that was part of the fun. Now, I have a confession to make about my chestnut trees. I collected chestnuts for chestnut trees and never got them put into dirt. So they've been in my fridge in a Ziploc ever since November. <laughs> Well, all is not lost. They're stratified for sure. So we'll take those out, dump them in a big thing of water and see what floats. The ones that floats are probably not good. That usually means they're moldy. So pull those off. If any of them stay below water, I'm totally planting those and we'll see. And if not, I guess I better do a round of chestnuts next year. Okay, next segment is garden economics update. Remember last week I talked to you about my garden economics project. Well, the truth is I am not going to be able to track every single grocery we buy because it takes two in this this household to collect that information and one of us does not like keeping receipts consistently. So um, I will track what I can on that, but 
it's that part's not looking good. However, I did set up the tracking spreadsheet this week and entered in what I'd spent on seeds, even though it was earlier in the year. So I've got $90 in there on seed expenditures so far. I have made $45 on selling watercress plants, and that means that I have $45 left that I have spent on the vegetable garden versus what I've earned from it. Now, I am not including egg sales or coffee sales in any of this. I'm just going to see, you know, output versus what we're using in income. Am I losing or making money by growing my vegetables organically? So, so far I've spent $45 and I am getting a lot of water crust to eat right now, but most of our peak of the garden time has not come. Next up, we have Tales from the Prepper Pantry. And this is just how we're keeping our winter stores interesting. And this week, here's, so remember the pork shoulder from last week? I was going to brine it and smoke it and then holler stuff came up. And here's what I did. I did a dry rub of smoked paprika, which is bourbon smoked paprika. Really good. One of my favorite spices. And I mixed that with salt and I rubbed it in there really good and let it sit. And then... Because the smoker's not built and it just didn't seem like a good time to do that, I decided instead of smoking it, I would cook it in my roasting oven. And I have this, I use it for turkeys uh, at Thanksgiving, but I use it for so many other things. It's a really great tool during canning season for tomato sauce. I put it in there with two cups, uh, four cups of water and three onions covered that puppy up and have been cooking it at 250 for about six hours so far. Uh, if you haven't used one of these roaster ovens, they basically work like a crock pot, but I didn't want it to be too moist in there because it's got plenty of its own natural fats. I think it'll be ready for us to eat today. It, it was a sizable piece of meat. Like I could not have fit it in a normal big crock pot. It was, gosh, it's, it's bigger than an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and thick. It's probably as big as, I'm trying to think of a good thing. It's, it's as big as my computer monitor, but you can't see what that looks like. Anyway, this thing is about 18 inches wide, about 14 inches tall, about six inches thick, and it's fairly square and there's a bone through the middle of it. So you can't just like squish it into things. Originally, I thought about cutting it up into two pieces and I thought, well, what the heck? We'll just cook the whole thing. We'll have like roast, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, green beans, and a salad tonight. And then all those sides will be left as I go out of town. There'll be lots of food left as I go out of town and I can make the rest into a pork shoulder stew to which I can add all sorts of yummy things from our free drink, including we have some turnips that are already cubed up and ready to go and pre-roasted that I can just throw in there. And yeah, for those of you turning purple because you don't like turnips, they're actually pretty good in stew. They take on all the flavors and, and do pretty well in stew and they, they keep their consistency really well. The other thing we're having this week, it's the last call for Jerusalem artichokes because they're going to start sending up their shoots soon. And once that happens, the roots lose their volume and aren't as tasty. So now is the time to move them around the yard and or eat them. Again, I've talked about this before. They're great grated on salads. They're great boiled up and served with butter. Those are my two favorite ways. You can throw them in stews. That's okay. Not as good as just steamed up with butter or grated over salad. Uh, we are putting pickled things on our wild salads, and this is really adding some interesting flavor dimensions. In fact, my my Aunt Helen's sweet beet recipe, they're like sweet and dill, so sweet and sour beets that I tried, and I wasn't sure I'd like it because it had so much sugar in it. I have been using that. Those on the salads, it's really good because it contrasts with the peppery flavor of the watercress. And then I've been keeping the brine to make salad dressing out of. In fact, I'll do an episode soon on four or five salad dressings you can make from things around the house. Once you start making homemade salad dressings, it's really hard to go back. Although when I get busy, I totally buy salad dressing at the store. But once you learn how to make them, it's hard to go back to the store stuff. I'm just warning you. And then the other thing we will be doing is eating through our beans and corn Fairly well. That's been happening just about every meal. But the one thing we haven't really gotten into, I also have just canned beets, not pickled beets, but canned beets. I've got yeah two cases of those. We haven't eaten a single one. So 
Two ways I'm going to start using those up is by including them in some of the holler stews we're making, as well as thinking about making a, a batch of borscht, and because borscht is pretty darn good. So one more segment before we move into the main topic of the show, which is how to can pickles. And that is stories from the holler. This is where we share what really happens for better or worse on the homestead. And I have a ducky update for you. They have a new habit established. In fact, I am recording this podcast really late. It's 345 right now. At four o'clock, I better move my patootie outside and make sure that there is lots of duck food in the duck pasture because they'll run up there and I'll fill up their swimming pool and they'll go splash around in there after being in the pond today because I let them out into the pond and then they'll go back to eating, you know, the grazing that I want them to do. But I've been letting them have fun in the pond every day for a certain amount of time. What I do is I let them out in the morning, leave them in the pasture they're supposed to be in. And about 11 or 12, I let them out into the yard and they wander around for a bit and then they go straight to the pond and start playing ducky games. And then, and probably eating mosquito larva, by the way. And then they come back up the hill about four o'clock because they get hungry. I mean, I know they're eating down there, but they kind of like the sunflower seeds we feed them. So they come up. I tell them all ducks go to bed. They walk straight into the pasture. I close the door. I fill up their food. I make sure the pool is nice and they're happy to go. What this has enabled me to do actually, because that pasture has a nice fence around it, is I don't have to close them in their coop when I go away at night. Now I'm just getting them up into the pasture, safe in the pasture with the door open to the coop. Now, if we had heavy predator pressure, I couldn't do that. But with my barky dogs, they're actually keeping most of the predators that would go over a fence like that out. So we haven't had predatory issues by doing this. That means I can go out to dinner, come home after dark, go down there, close the door, because they do go into their coop after dark usually. Occasionally I'll find one outside in the morning, but usually they're there. And the other thing going on in the holler this week is that Nicole can't start her tractor. That's right. <clears throat> Tractor's here. We're using it. We're only using it when Ford starts it. So I need to learn how to start my tractor with the ether, and I have not learned how to do that yet because I am not mechanically knowledgeable. I know a lot of things about plumbing and wiring, but I, I just like the, the whole gas mechanic engine thing. It just has never been something I've learned about. So I, I, I've been explained how to do this, but sometimes it's better for my aural kinesthetic learning style to just do it. So Ford has agreed to show me how to start my own darn tractor. And it's, it, was, it was a little colder this week than the week before. So I think also it, it doesn't start as well in the cold and really needs that extra boost. So those are the two stories from the hauler. Hasn't been a horribly eventful week, which I'm thankful for. Oh, one thing. Don't forget Cider Hollow has a grafting workshop. Um, he's got 10 spaces left. I talked to him today. And it's $45 a person. You'll get to learn from a really good instructor over there on his farm. I'll be serving holler roast. And it's um, it's a guy from Spiral Ridge Permaculture who's going to teach us how to do grafting. I think I, I'm going to bring some scion from here too, just to see what we can do with our own stuff. So I wanted to mention that. Link is in the show note if you're interested. And this is in Savannah, Tennessee. So not too far to drive from Memphis. Um, kind of far to drive from Nashville, but not bad. And I, you know, I'm carpooling with one person already. If somebody else wants to hop in my car, I'm going down and back the same day. Okay, so on to the topic of today's show. Learn canning in eight projects. Project number one is pickles. You may wonder why pickles. Because pickles are harder to do than just fruit, right? No, not really. They're, the reason I chose pickles, it was the first thing my mom showed me how to can, actually. I had learned how to can from my grandparents as a kid. But... When I got back into it, mom was like, oh, hey, you've got cucumbers. Let's make pickles. And she's, my mom, when she gets something in her head, gets it done. So we gathered everything we needed and she showed me how to make pickles. And the best thing about how this went down was she was showing me a food that's really hard to make a mistake on. If you follow directions with pickles, the most likely food poisoning thing to happen is, uh, oh, wait, there isn't one. Okay, so the only thing that might happen is you let it go bad because you canned it wrong. And if that happens, you will see mold. And if you see mold, don't eat it. But even that's really hard because the way you make pickles is you put them in vinegar and salt, which are preservatives. So 
I think if you want to learn how to can, the best thing to do is use pickles because you don't have to worry about food safety. They're really easy to make. And at the end, you get something that's really, really yummy to share with your friends. And it's like, it's kind of nice the first time you can something to have a success that tastes good, right? So that's why I chose pickles. And a lot of people don't start with pickles because they aren't growing the pickling cucumbers. Forget that. Just go to the store and buy your cucumbers there. Now, those are not usually made for pickling, especially at this time of year. But so what? That just means your consistency won't be quite as firm. Doesn't matter. Pickles are easy to make and the cucumbers that you get at the store are just fine. What you want to do is choose the firmest ones you can get at the store. Or if you know a gardener who has them already, go for it. I like to learn canning well before I need to do canning, which is why I'm starting this series now. If you do pickles this week or next week, you'll already know how to do pickles when it's pickle season and you really can get your hands on can on the, the, the pickling cucumbers at the farmer's market or when you grow your own. And that means you have a leg up because you won't be worried about ruining those ones. Cucumbers at the store are cheap right now. Now, if you can get organic ones, I would. That's just me. I don't like the pesticide-y stuff on my food. And I certainly don't want to can pesticide-y stuff. So that's why pickles. And let's talk a little bit about supplies. You do not need to go spend a gajillion dollars on canning supplies to learn how to make pickles. The best thing you can do if you're going to try this or or start the series, unless you know that you love canning and you're going to start doing canning, is go to a friend who you know cans and say, can I borrow it? Can I borrow your stuff? I want to learn how to make pickles. They might even show you how to make pickles. Um, If you can borrow the, the water bath canner from them or their pressure canner, even better, just do that get the special tongs and you're good to go and you didn't have to spend money on anything but jars and jar lids. And that's kind of nice because then you can try it out and if you decide you like it and then you can go back and sort of build up your canning. Now, let's talk about a starting canning kit. If, you, if you're if you serious and you know you want to get started, let's let's talk about what you need to have in order to, to just, you know, responsible canning There are lots of different little doohickey gadget thingies that you can get for canning. I'm just going to talk through the basics because who wants to spend a bunch of money on a bunch of stuff you don't know if you need it or not yet. Let's talk about first your canner. That's like the big pot that you're canning all the stuff in. And let's talk about a pressure canner versus that water bath kit that you see at Walmart. Now at Walmart for like 25, 30 bucks, you can get a water bath canner And it has a bunch of other stuff in it, like the jar, a lifter. Sometimes they include a a jar tong. Sometimes they include a canning funnel. Anywhere from 25 to 40 bucks. I say don't buy it. If you're serious about getting into canning, you should just go straight to a pressure canner. Because if you just get the water bath canner, like the big pot for water bath canning that doesn't do pressure canning, you're going to have to buy the pressure canner anyway later when you decide you want to can beans or corn, or soups, or stocks, or any of the million of things that you might want to pressure can. Why would you do that? You might as well build your flexibility, and it costs a little bit more on the front end, but it costs less in the long run. And so if you, in fact, if you look for used pressure canners, you can probably get one for about the same price. I've seen some of those on eBay today, and I went and looked, and you don't want to get like this is my great grandmother's antique pressure. No, don't get that one. Look, look for some of the ones that are more modern. A lot of people have tried canning and decided they don't want it. In fact, I bet if you put on Facebook, hey, I need canning stuff. Who wants to sell it? Somebody will come up in your network. Who does? Somebody in my choir has a, a pressure canner that she's not using that she wants to get rid of. So, you know, it's, it's usually not that hard to find them. So as far as pressure canning goes, there are two major ones that tend to be the most purchased that I know the most about. And one is the Presto brand. And I have a link to that. It's an Amazon affiliate link, just for full disclosure on the show notes. And this one is not the best one you can get, but it is affordable. And I have been using one of these for 10 years. It has a rubber gasket around the top to keep the pressure going. And so like in an uh, S 
HTF situation where you can't get replacement gaskets and that sort of thing, this canner will eventually wear out and not be useful to me anymore. However, that hasn't happened and I've been using it for 10 years with the same gasket. Gasket's still good. I, I actually have a backup gasket here I haven't had to use yet. I've had the gauge tested once a year. It's a, it's a dial gauge canner. Um, there's, there's two, there's weighted gauge versus a dial gauge. The dial gauge, you need to bring that down to the extension office once a year and just make sure your, your gauge is reading right. Cause you don't want to poison yourself if you're using the pressure side. So it's a Presto pressure canner made for canning. I got the biggest one they have and I can do, I think 14 pints and seven quarts at a time. So not all at once, either 14 pints or seven quarts. So it, it does a pretty good job. And it was what I could afford. And it's always been what I can afford. Now, the one I really want, though, is the weighted gauge, all American brand pressure canner that is $239. <laughs> I also have a link to that in the show notes. I can't afford that. I, well, I could. I, I just have to choose to not afford something else. And since since the Presto one cost me like 60 bucks when I bought it, you can see the price difference. However, the All-American canner, the cool thing of two things, it's that weighted gauge, which you can really trust. The weight does not, like, it's not going to change unless the mechanics of the gauge system changes. Also, you do not need the rubber gasket. To seal this, you use Vaseline around the rim. And I'm pretty sure you could substitute something else for Vaseline. So it, you um, put the lid on and you put Vaseline around it. You screw these these little clamps down on the on the All American pressure canner, and it's pretty cool. So so as you're going into this, ask yourself how serious am I? What budget do I have? And then if you're gonna buy the canner, like an actual canning pot, if you can afford to, don't get the water bath only one. Just go straight for a pressure canner because, as I said, you you don't have to know anything about pressure canning for this. You can just use it as a water bath canner. That's the cool thing about pressure canners. Okay. The other thing that you'll want to get your hands on is probably a, one of those jar lifters. So the tongs that lift the jars out. In fact, probably is not the right word. You need one of those if you're going to can. Now, some canners have built in this big rack where you can lift them all out at once. That's just intended to get them up higher in the pot. And then you use the tong. And the tong is designed to pick, pick up mason jars. So those don't cost very much. Again, if you can borrow one for the friend for this first segment, go for it. And then you'll need 12 quart sized wide mouth mason jars. You can get these almost anywhere like Walmart, Amazon, Dollar General, Layman's, any local store that carries canning supplies. I saw them at Ace Hardware. Uh, the one thing you need to know on the wide mouth ones is those run out first. I can get almost year round the small mouth canning jars and those are good for some things. But when I'm making pickles, I want wide mouth jars because I can get my hand down in there. I can pack them more tightly. I can fit more cucumbers in each jar and it's better. Then you'll need 12 lids and rings. Now, if you're buying your jars new, it comes with them. If you're getting them used at a garage sale or at a flea market, often they will not have the rings and lids. You can buy those rings and lids off the shelf at Walmart right now. I think they have them at Dollar General too in our area. So you'll want 12 jars, 12, I say 12, you don't really need them for this recipe just one time through, but they come in sets of 12. So you might as well buy 12. And then you also need to pick up some pickling salt or canning salt. And the reason you do this is because the salt does not cloud up the water. Normal table salt will cloud up the water. And this is because normal table salt includes an anti-caking agent in there that it basically keeps the salt from sticking together. I know we all have to put rice in our salt shakers down here in the south, but there is an anti-caking agent in the salt that if, if you can with it, it's not going to hurt anything. Like if all you have is table salt, use it. But it does make the water cloudy and the end product a little less visually appealing. So those are the things you should pick up. So I'm reviewing. If you're serious about canning, get a pressure canner, not a water bath canner. Get a jar lifter. Get 12 quart size jars that are wide mouth and the the related lids and rings and pick, pickling salt or canning salt. And then if you're really, 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 really serious, like you know you're in, man, then 
consider do like consider getting like a canning toolkit and that that's something they make them all sorts of different kinds I've, I've got two online i've got one that's 40 bucks that comes with a metal canning funnel and i've got one that's i think 30 bucks that comes with a plastic canning funnel i prefer the metal they have them at Walmart. They're probably cheaper there than anything I can find online right now. So, you know, like just keep your, especially this time of year, keep your eyes open. And these are kits that come with the the jar lifter that I talked to you about. They come with another set of tongs that are really good for reaching down in a deep boiling water bath to pick out lids off the bottom when you're sterilizing those. They come with a little spatula tool that can, you, you know, kind of go from between the food and the edge of the jar to make sure you don't have funky air bubbles in there. That also measures your head space, which we'll talk about in a second. And I, I, did I say canning funnel? Canning funnel, very important. That's how you get your stuff in the jar without having a big mess. Now, you do not need the canning funnel to make pickles. That's why I did not include it in the bare minimum list. But if you are really going to do it, it's probably worth the, you know, 15 bucks or whatever, 20 bucks you're going to spend on that to get all of those tools together. Or again, ask around because some of your friends have tried canning and they don't like it and they're just sitting in their garage. And if you can get it free, why not do it? Okay, so you have your canning supplies collected. Let's talk about pickles. Pickles are so easy to make that you'll wonder why you keep buying them at the store in giant gallon jars. What you need to make this particular recipe, which is the recipe we've been using at the Holler Homestead for 10 years, is about eight pounds of cucumbers. This is gonna make about seven quart sized jars. So it's a pretty good sized batch. Make sure that your cucumbers are not longer than four inches long or make pickle slices. You can totally do that or you can cut it up into chunks. Sometimes the only pickles you can, or the only cucumbers you can find at the store are those like British ones or the European ones that are really long. You can use those for pickling. That's actually the worst thing to pickle if you're going to make pickles, but it'll still taste good. Um, Better yet, better is if you can find just smaller cucumbers at the store and put them together. Now, if you get to the store and you find they only have like the the seven to eight inch long ones, just resign yourself to making pickle spirits. You can cut them in half and cut them into quarters and they'll be fine. But what you want are eight pounds of cucumbers, 14 cloves of garlic cut in half, 14 heads of dill weed, seven hot peppers, and 28 peppercorns. That's what you need for the pickles. Now let's talk a second about dill weed. For some reason, I think it's because they've started selling these pre-mixed pickling uh, spice packets at the store. It's really hard in the South where I live to find dill weed. Like when it's, what that is, is dill. You see dill at the store in those little packages. If you let it get really tall, it puts a head on and like a flower and makes seeds. That's the part you want. If you can't get your head on your hands on that, don't worry. Just either buy a couple packages of the fresh dill that you see, which are kind of expensive, but whatever, or get some dried dill in just the spice area. It, it, it's not as good as if you can get your hands on on heads of dill, and this time of year is not the season for them. So you're not going to be able to buy these at the store. I actually, when I see them for sale or when I get them for my garden. I do not let them go to waste. I either use them in pickling right away or I dry them and store them. So I do have probably 28 dill heads right now and they are dried and ready. In fact, my mom sent me a little gift in January. She said, hey, I sent you a gag gift and I opened it up and it was dill. I was so excited. So she had dried her own dill heads over the fall and then sent me both the heads and some of the stems. They get a woody stem. You can also use that. So the ideal is that you have 14 heads of dill weed. If you do not have that, don't worry. Just use powdered dill. You want to use two teaspoons for, per jar or get the fresh dill at the store and use two spears of that per jar. Just wanted to say that. Now, the other thing you need to have is a half cup of pickling or kosher salt. Um, the kosher salt doesn't work as well as the pickling salt, in my opinion. So I tend to, to use pickling salt unless I am completely out of it. And then, then I end up with a cloudy brine. 
you need five and a half cups of vinegar and six cups of water. That's everything you need. I've listed these in the show notes, so you can just look back there for the recipe. So first thing you do, make the brine. So you mix your half cup of pickling or kosher salt or whatever kind of salt you're using together. Five and a half cups of 5% vinegar, which is your standard white vinegar that you get at the store. Six cups of water. Put that in a pot and put it on your stove and turn it on. And you want to bring that to a low boil. That takes me about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so in in my kitchen and I just get that started. Now while that is heating, what I do is I fill my canning pot with the seven or eight jars, depending on what kind you have that will fit in there. Put it in the sink and I get the hot water from the tap going and I fill it with hot water so that the water comes up over the rims of the jars. And the way I do this is I put it in and I have like there's one jar in the middle and there's six around the outside. And I let the faucet go into the jars. And when one is full, I rotate it so the next one's filling. And then I take the one that's full and I switch it with the one in the middle. And then I basically rotate those jars like a tire till they're all full. And then I let the water flow over the side of them. And once it's up over the lips of the jars, I also drop in the seven jar lids and jar rings and I put that on my stove on high. Now, the way I do it on my stove, I have like the one good burner and then I have the three crummy burners. I have the brine heating on the crummy burner and I have the can, the the jars that are full of water heating on the big burner. On my stove, what happens is the pickling brine comes up to temperature first and I just turn that off at that time. And I let the jars continue to get up to boiling and I boil them in the pot for like a minute. I think technically you're supposed to go five minutes. I just let it go for a minute, turn that off. I pull jars out and dump the hot water from from inside the jar down the sink carefully. And this is when you're using those jar tongs. And then I put the jars aside and I leave the contents of four of the jars I dump back into the pot. So three of them you dump down the sink and four you leave in your canning pot, the liquid from there. Because when you fill the, um, when we put the jars in, you still want that water to rise up over the edge, not just up to the edge. Now, if you had gone well, well, well over the top of your jars when you did the sterilization process, then go ahead and dump out more jars. That's fine. I I tend to err on the side of a little, leaving a little more liquid in and then scooping it out as I go as I'm putting jars in. Now, when that's done, I turn that burner, which is my best burner, on low, just to keep the water warm. I turn the brine back on high to get it back up to boiling. And then while that's heating, you pack the jars as follows. You take your two dill heads per jar. So you have seven jars. You put two dill dill heads in the bottom of the jar. You put two cloves of garlic in each, one pepper, and four to five peppercorns per jar. Once that's done, <clears throat> you'll want to start loading them up with the, the pickles. And the way I do it is I'd like tilt the jar on its side and I put the pickles in long ways so that it's long top to bottom, not crossways. Basically, I guess you'd call that vertically in the jar, not horizontally. And as I said, if you could not find cucumbers that were smaller than four inches, the reason that four inch number is there is it's a it's a good size of of cucumber to pack into the jar. But if you're doing spikes, you can cut them. I think my jars go five inches tall, so you can cut it up to basically where the shoulder of the jar is. You don't want them higher than the shoulder of the jar. And that shoulder is basically where it goes from being a wide jar to going in a little bit for the rim. And you pack those in as tightly as you can. And if you end up at the end with, you know, some inconsistencies and heights, I take little teeny cucumbers and and or slices of cucumbers and fill it in till it's up to the shoulder of the jar. If for some reason I don't have the right shape, I just leave an empty space. What you don't want to do is go higher with your pickles than the shoulder of the jar. And so I get the jars 
packed and usually by then the brine is boiling again. Once it boils, I turn it to low to keep it simmering. And then as I pack each jar, usually I have about three or four jars packed and I fill those with brine you, and you basically take that hot brine, pour it over the pickles. Not, they're not pickles yet, over the cucumbers. And you bring that liquid up over the top of them until there's a half inch between the top of the liquid and the top of the jar. And you can measure that very precisely with a ruler or you can estimate it. What you don't want it to be is less than half an inch. If it's three quarters of an inch instead of half an inch, that's okay. So long as the liquid is up over the top of the tallest cucumbers. If it's not, pull the tall ones out. You don't want any part of that cucumber sticking up out of the liquid. Once that's done, you take a paper towel with some vinegar and you just clean off the rim of your jar. Then take your finger and you rub it around the jar. What you're feeling for here is are there any chips or burrs in the glass? Every so often you will get a jar that was just manufactured wrong and it has a funny little burr. And if that burr is there or if there's a chip that you couldn't see with your eyes, then your your jar lids won't seal. So you run your finger, you're just feeling to make sure it's basically smooth on top. Take that sterilized lid and you put it on top of the jar and then you screw down the ring, hand screw it. Now they do make jar lid tighteners, don't use one of those. The whole purpose is you hand screw this down, you're gonna put it in the water bath and air is gonna come out of that jar. And if it's screwed down too tightly and air cannot come out of that jar, the jar will explode. So just hand tighten them and then use your jar tongs to place them in the canner. The canner should be on low. It's probably simmering by now, but if it's not, no big deal at all. So you fill those jars up with the brine. And then once I, if, again, what, I, what usually happens to me is I have four jars, I fill them up and then I have three jars left to pack. And then what I do is I pack them with the cucumbers and fill them with brine one at a time as, as I'm, um, as actually as quickly as I can, because sometimes the brine starts boiling a little too violently if I'm slow. Now, if that happens, just turn it off. You want it to be at a simmer or a boil as you're pouring it over the cucumbers. Do whatever you need to do with your stove to keep it there. If that means turn it off and then turn it on and turn it off, turn it off, totally fine. You can also just pack all your jars and then bring the brine up to boil and do it. I like to do them at the same time just so that I don't waste time in the packing and canning. So once all seven jars have the cucumbers and the lids on and are in the water bath canner, you want to make sure you have an inch of water at least over the top of your jars. And then you turn that burner on high and bring the pot to a rolling boil. For me, that usually takes five or 10 minutes, even though I've just put hot stuff in there. So this is a good time to, you know, read your favorite book at the dining room table while keeping an eye on the canner, or maybe spend some time working on your podcast notes, whatever it is you have that's sort of a quiet activity, or, you know, watch a TV show, whatever it is you like to do. Just do it in the kitchen, because the biggest mistake I have made at this time is walking out of the room. And this is, you know, learning how to can, so you just kind of hang out wait for the pot to boil. It'll start boiling slowly at first, won't be a proper rolling boil. You'll know it's a rolling boil when the whole top is disturbed with bubbles, basically. I do have a pot lid that I put on mine. So I found a pot lid at Goodwill that's not the pressure canning lid. And I, I will put that over the top of the pot just to keep some more heat in that helps it boil a little faster. Once it gets up to the rolling boil, what you want to do is set your timer. And for quarts, for pickles, the time to process is 15 minutes if you're at a thousand feet in elevation or lower. It is 20 minutes from 1,001 feet to 6,000 feet, and it's 25 minutes if you're over 6,000 feet. Now, you may be wondering, how do I know how, like, where my elevation is? If you don't know, that's no big deal. Just head over to Google Maps, look up your property address, and then there's a topographical link you can hit to show you the topography, and that shows you what your elevation is, and you can pinpoint much more precisely now than in the in the old days. If you're uncertain if you are below or above a thousand feet, but fairly certain you're below six thousand feet, it's okay to process them for twenty minutes. So what that means is that you're boiling them for that amount of time. 
set the timer, timer goes off, you turn the stove off. And then you can actually pull them out right away, but all of the safety buffs tell you to wait 10 or 15 minutes for the water to cool down because it might still be boiling. What you don't want to do is reach your arm over there while it's spitting water out at you. But there's no actual food safety reason you need to let the water cool down. And I don't because I'm not very patient. So I usually have a towel set out on my counter because these are very hot. I use those canning, the, the can canning tongs to bring the jars out of the water bath. And I put them with about an inch between each jar in rows on my counter to cool. And this is the hardest part. Don't touch them after you do that. So put them somewhere where you can leave them. They say 24 hours. You don't really need to leave them there that long. You need to leave them until they are room temperature. And that that can take, you know, two hours. That can take 12 hours. It just depends on the temperature of your kitchen. I usually do my canning later in the day and just let them sit overnight. And by morning, they're usually fine. So you just put them aside and then you, the next day when they've cooled or however long you've left them, what you do is you take your, your finger and you put it over the top of each lid and you poke. And if the lid doesn't move, you know that's a good seal. If it goes, duk, 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 you know that's a bad seal. I get bad seals on pickles about never. I've never had one on pickles. I've had it on other things, never on pickles. So... The thing that would happen to make a bad seal, one of a couple things. One, you didn't get the food off the rims. Two, there was a chip you didn't find or a burr. Or three, your canning jar lid was faulty. And that does happen from time to time. But pickles, because they're in a salt and vinegar brine, don't tend to leave a lot of weird pasty stuff on the lids of the jars. So it's very rare that you will have a um, a failure there. But if you do... No big deal. You, you you label, you take the rims off of all the ones that have good seals. And you can usually lift the jar a little bit by the lid. You know that's really stuck on there if you can do that. And then you label your lids what they are. I usually say PKL and then I say 1-6. And if I'm really worried about it, um, then I'll put the actual date. I'll put, you know, September 1st, 2016 or whatever. 1-6 for 16. I guess I should say 1-7 because we're in 2017. So you label them, put them in a nice, cool, dark place for storage. If you have a pantry or a root cellar, you can put them there. The reason I take the jar, like the rims off, the screwy part of the canning jar lid set up is that it's pretty humid here. If I leave them on, they rust. If they rust, they get stuck to the jar. Sometimes it's really hard to unscrew them that way. And in particular with pickles, which have vinegar in there, those lids are inclined to to rust and that just speeds up the process of the rusting which then reduces the amount of time that they're good because if your jar lids rust through that you know that's just been exposed to air for god knows how long if you just have it sitting somewhere in the back shelf so put those in a dark place i like to leave mine for six weeks for the best flavor but there is no reason you can't eat some of them right away you will find out the very next day it already tastes like pickles it's just after six weeks, you get a nice mellow garlic infusion, dill infusion, hot pepper. It's pretty good if you wait six weeks at least. Now, if you have a failed jar, like let's say you did this and six of them sealed and one didn't. That one that failed, you just leave the ring on it, put it in your fridge and eat it. Just like pickles. In fact, you can leave it for six weeks in your fridge if you want to, to get the flavor. And then dive in, man. It's it's good. I mean, those are the ones you test if you have a failure. You can reprocess it if you want to, but why would you do that for one jar? It's a jar of pickles. Pickles are yummy. So that is how you can pickles. And I encourage you, if you haven't ever canned anything, like go out in the next two weeks and grab something and, you know, get the cucumbers at the store, borrow some canning equipment from a friend, get some jars. They're out right now. Get some pickling salt. It's out. Get some dill and make some really tasty pickles. You'll you'll see how different they are. Their consistency is not usually quite as crisp as the store ones, but they're 
They taste so much better. In fact, I just gave a jar to a friend of mine who stopped through. She's a truck driver. She was driving through the state and she she stopped by and I had one jar of baby pickles left. Like a friend of mine had picked all these pickles that were about you know, like no longer than my thumb and most of them less. And I had canned that jar with the intention of putting it in the state fair. And then um, when my brother-in-law had brain surgery in August, I did not enter anything in the fair at all. So they've just been sitting on the shelf. And I thought, you know, a truck driver, smaller jar. This was a pint size instead of a quart size jar. She'll like these. And I handed them to her and she was like super happy with the flavor. So um, it's a really good recipe, I promise. And if you like dill pickles, it's it's really great. Now, the next project in the series of canning will not be about pickling. We'll move on to canning fruit. However, as I develop this series, I am planning to video it and then I will talk about different recipes for pickles, including pickling sweet pickles like the bread and butter pickles, doing other vegetables like beets and okra and squash and all the other things that you can pickle up. I'll also talk about some of the techniques you can use that are more advanced, but that's not what you need when you're learning how to can for the first time, right? Just go out, make some pickles. Then later in the season, if you've got green beans coming on, use the same recipe and you put beans in there instead of instead of cucumbers. And I mean, that's what I do with my beets. I cut my beets up and I put them in, same recipe. I actually pre-cook my beets a bit so that they're tender, but it's basically the same process. You just need to decide what your brine flavor is. And once you've got that down, you're good to go. So the next the series number two or project number two will actually not be a pickling project because once you learn the basics of pickling, you know how to do that. We'll move on to fruit. Okay, it is time for our last segment of the day. And this is a word from Samantha, the savings ninja. Now, you may be wondering why we do this segment. In fact, somebody, one of my friends listened to the podcast last time she was on and was like, why is that in there? It doesn't fit. Well, it does fit. It's because one part of homesteading and living off the land and all of the things we're starting to do here is simplifying our lives and finding ways to build economy into our system of living so we don't have to earn as much money to pay for all of the things. And a great way to do this is find ways to build habits that reduce how much cash you need and preferably ones that don't take too much of your time to manage. And so when I got to know Samantha, I realized that she has spent a lifetime figuring out how to save money in different ways. And a question came in this week about which phone apps she likes to use and why. So with that, I'll hand it over to Samantha. Hello, Living Korean in Tennessee. This is Samantha, your savings ninja, here with your tip. This week, Nicole asked me about apps. What are my favorite apps? Well, I'm going to say my favoritest favorite app is Ibotta. Now, before you go and download it, I'm going to ask Nicole to put a link in the show, show notes. Ibotta does have a referral bonus, and not just a referral bonus for the person who referred you, but a referral bonus for you. So you get extra money if you use the referral link I'm going to ask Nicole to put in her show notes. Ibotta is great for saving money on the groceries you're going to buy anyway. Um, they're electronic coupons. You don't necessarily present them in the store, but you get money back later, um, and they will cash it out to your PayPal. Now, after I bought it, and I bought it is hands down my favorite, my next favorite app would be the one for the store near you. If you shop at Walmart, you should totally be using Walmart's app, their savings catcher, especially since they're phased out the, the um, price matching at the registers is fantastic. It's a great way to save a little money while shopping at Walmart. If you shop at Target, uh, Cartwheel uh, for Target saves you money on things you're going to buy anyway. But Nicole's had a secondary question. How do you keep from spending more money than you intended? If you've looked at your store sale flyer, if you know what you're going in for beforehand and you walk in with a list and stick to your list, that's a great way to avoid buying things you didn't intend to buy. Second thing you need to be aware of when you go into the store is your level of hunger. They've done studies. If you're hungry and you go grocery shopping, you're going to buy more stuff because your brain is going, need the food, and there's food in front of you. Next, you need to be aware of having a budget. If you walk into the store with $100 cash in your pocket and that's all you have to spend, you're not going to go over that. Now, I don't mean to suggest that you should only shop with cash if you don't want to. By all means, shop however you like, but set yourself up a strict budget. A lot of people who talk about saving money talk about how much they saved, either as a percentage or as a dollar amount. I saved $20,000 on groceries this year. That's the silliest thing ever. I saved 90% of my groceries this month. It's not about how much you save. It's about how much you spend. Don't shop hungry. 
make a list, use a budget. Great words from Samantha, the savings ninja. And I have tried the Ibotta app. And part of why, you know, when I saw the question that commented about apps, I added, how do you keep from spending too much? Part of my issue is I see all the things on Ibotta and suddenly want to buy things I don't need. So I know I've had to institute some more discipline into my own shopping experience just to make sure that I don't, you know, go buy a, a bunch of brands of soap or something that I don't really need. However, I bought is great. Like when you get money back for bananas and you were going to buy bananas anyway, it's really cool. And funny that she brought up the savings catcher because I totally use that. This is, this is how I've um, talked Mark into saving some of his receipts. He brings every Walmart receipt home because I scan it with my phone and then if it find it scans like other flyers in your area, and if it finds something advertised for less, then guess what? It gives you that money back. So that's kind of a cool thing too. Now, she's right. If if you're shopping at a specific store like Kroger's or Food Lion, you can try their apps too. It's I think it's really important though to read about the app a bit in advance. And I have I've used the Food Lion app to some benefit, but then I started noticing that I can get better prices on some of the same things at other stores. So it actually has done the opposite of, of developed loyalty for me. So it's kind of a double-edged sword for the, for the store, I suppose. Anyway, uh, Samantha, I am putting that link in the show notes. Guys, it's totally worth it. I did actually use her link originally way back when I started this app and I redeemed you know, like 45 cents for bananas and a couple other little things. And then it, it gave me 10 bucks. I was pretty excited about that just for installing an app and using it a couple times. And with that, remember, if you want to drop me a question, topic idea, or comment, feel free to email me at NicoleSauce at gmail.com. And for those of you who prefer YouTube, we do get to show up on YouTube by Tuesday every week. And they are not letting me do a custom domain domain. URL like forward slash live free TN or something until I have a hundred followers. Apparently this is something new. A couple people reached out to me last week and said, what are you talking about, man? And I don't know if it's because I use their brand page feature or if it's because they've, they've instituted new law, new like rules for that, but I have to be on there 30 days. I have to have a hundred followers and then I can get my forward slash. You know? So thanks to all of you who've gone over there and followed my channel. It is, the link is in the show notes and you can also just probably search living free in Tennessee on YouTube at this point and find me. Well, this week I have a big business trip taking me away for several days and I sang a concert with my choir last week, like over the weekend. So making forward progress here at the Holler Homestead was kind of a challenge. And I did get the tomatoes started and I got the ducks under control. In fact, I had to leave in the middle of recording this podcast to go put them away. And a couple of friends were over and watched me do that. I got my coffee sales set up online and launched egg subscriptions officially. I mean, I've been doing outreach on that and selling a few directly to people who know me, but it officially got put on the website and even managed to put seeds in the ground uh, and start selling watercress. I, I have peas in the ground, man. That's awesome. I have people who are buying water. You can buy watercress for me a, a few bags a week I sell. I don't sell a lot because I don't want to tax out our watercress patch, but I have some friends here locally who buy it for use on their salads because they don't have watercress at their property. So it's not too bad for a busy time. And I do have to confess something, though. My laundry is way behind. Oh, well, we'll get over that. I, I have enough clothes to wear, so we're good to go. Anyway, that's life here in the holler. Thank you so much for joining me today here on Living Free in Tennessee. And guys, go out and make it a great week. Mm-hmm.